Hello and welcome to Health Live at Seniors Today. We are delighted to have you with us. And uh, uh, with us today is leading ENT surgeon, or let me get the name right, uh, otorhinolaryngologist, Dr. Ajay Doifore. And he is going to be uh, speaking with us uh, uh, on ENT care for senior citizens. A little about Dr. Doifore. Uh, he is a senior and well-known ENT surgeon practicing for over 20 years. Uh, he is with the Nanavati Max Super Speciality Hospital and has performed more than 5,000 successful ENT surgeries till date. He did his MS ENT and master's in, uh, from the KEM Hospital, and, which is the GS Medical College. He has a fellowship in functional endoscopic sinus from Austria and a fellowship in cochlear implant and implantable hearing aids from Germany. Dr. Doifode is currently president of the Mumbai ENT Association. He's also honorary head of unit at the HBT Municipal Hospital, which is uh, uh, attached to the Cooper Hospital in, 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 in Northwest Mumbai. He has uh, two private clinics in Villapale and Andheri in, in Mumbai. And his special interests are endoscopic nose, sinus, and skull-based surgeries, and uh, endoscopic ear surgeries and thyroid gland surgeries. So without any further ado, I would welcome Dr. Ajay Dalfade to Health Live at Seniors Today. Welcome, sir. Uh, at the outset, let me thank Pradhiman ji for inviting me and having over for this session. And uh, without any delay, I will start the session. So yes. yeah, yeah, over would... to you. And you have a presentation uh, for our uh, uh, readers today. Right. So I have a very brief presentation to set the ball rolling. So let me share my screen. Yeah. And uh, until Dr. Doifare shares his screen, those of you who have any questions, please put them in the Q&A tab and ideally uh, mention your age and your gender as it will help uh, uh, Dr. Doifare answer your question better. Over to you, doctor. Yeah. So can you share my, uh, can you see my screen now? No, we can't. We can't. We just. Let me try one more time. Try now, sir. Can you see it now? No, we can't. I, uh... One second. Yes. Okay. We've, we've, yeah, we've started now. Great. Is it started now? Yes. Yes, it has. Okay, great. So, okay. Fine? Yeah. 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 So, hearing is one of our five senses which starts dwindling down with age. And uh, this is the second most common cause of viewers lived with disability. Unlike blindness, deafness, one can't see and often gets ridiculed, unlike the blind who get sympathized. So this happens at the inner ear level. This is the external ear, this is the eardrum, this is the middle ear where the hearing bones vibrate, and this sound gets conducted to the cochlea. This is the snail-shaped structure. And from here, to the, through the nerve, to the brain. So the, the, the weakness starts in this part of the inner ear, where the uh, disease can be either in the cochlea, or the hearing nerve, or at the higher level, which is at the brain, that is the brain stem, or the cerebral cortex. So if you do a hearing assessment or a hearing testing or a audiometry of a patient who, a senior citizen who has hearing issues, we get this typical kind of an audiogram. This is not a very complicated graph. This is a very easy graph to understand. On X axis, we have the various frequencies, sound frequencies, and on the Y axis, we have, you know, the decibels uh, from zero to 120. So the, the more the values, the, the proportionally the deterioration is more. So these are the low frequencies, these are the mid frequency, and these are the high frequency. In a, in a characteristic 
audiogram of a senile deafness patient, the high frequency starts going down first. They can still manage with hearing without any uh, conversational issues. Once the lower frequencies and the mid frequency starts going down, that's when the patient starts complaining. He can't hear or has to keep the TV volume high or the or is not able to hear clearly in a noisy room where two, three people are talking. Or sometimes uh, now with the new thing which we have seen is with COVID is people are wearing masks and uh, because of masks, they are not unable to lip reading. Our brain is a very smart organ. It tries to overcome the hearing handicap by allowing us to lip read. But when people are uh, outdoors and uh, they are surrounded by people wearing masks, they are unable to lip read and the hearing deterioration is more pronounced then. So senile deafness is a natural physiological process, like how we develop cataract in the eyes. It's not a pathology, it's just an opacification of the lens. Similarly, senile deafness, uh, most of us will have it or already have it. So it starts by age 60 and typically it starts in one year and usually involves both years. There are other causes of senile deafness related hearing loss, which we call as nerve deafnesses. And there are certain important conditions, which just I thought I should brief you on that. There's this condition called as sudden sensory neural hearing loss, which is nothing like a stroke of the inner ear hearing nerve. Here, typically one fine day you get up and you can't hear things. And uh, there might be some dizziness associated, or there might be some nausea, vomiting. Also, uh, the patients will come when he keeps that history of sudden loss of hearing in one of the ears. And once we do an audiogram, we typically see the graph, which is you know showing only hearing loss, which is significant, sometimes very profound in one of the ears. And this is an emergency medical condition. If Treated in the first 48 to 70 hours, the hearing recovery is near normal. But if there is delay or if uh, the treatment is not started on time, then it can lead to permanent hearing disability. Now, in a metropolitan city like Mumbai, we, have, we are continuously bombarded with loud noises. Maybe uh, for a brief second, which might be a gunshot or an air uh, honking from the traffic noises or continuously uh, music which is or sound which is you know uh, the ears are bearing the brand so uh, these are very detrimental to hearing so what we see is key this is another cause of nerve deafness in practice and another important cause in senior citizens is they are on multiple drugs so certain drugs are autotoxic that means they can cause uh, weakness or degeneration of the hearing nerves. So common drugs which, which uh, are li uh, likely to cause hearing loss are antibiotics, uh, certain anti-cancer drugs, certain non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And sometimes we have seen even infections like malaria where we give quinine and chloroquine have also caused hearing. So it's very important when you uh, uh, notice any uh, hearing related symptoms, whether it is uh, diminished hearing or any fullness in the ear, any buzzing, ringing, or any vertigo, especially in treatment for some chronic illness like tuberculosis or cancer, it is important to notify your treating doctor that these are the new symptoms we have noticed. He might stop the drug for a brief period, get the hearing assessment done, and if it's confirmed it is autotoxicity, then either the drug might be substituted or it can be, uh, you can take a drug holiday for a few days as advised by your physician. There are other important causes also, which, which are structural defects or which are anatomical problems in the ear. Like this is an image of a eardrum. 
and we can see there is a large perforation or a hole in this eardrum so much so that the hearing bones are exposed so this is one of the hearing bones malleus this is the hearing bone second incus and this is the stapes bone and we can see the middle ear through the 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 perforation it's a pretty large defect and sound is not going to get conducted into the ear and this patient with age will have a mixed kind of a deafness where the nerve is also affected and there is a conductive problem also similarly there is a bone eating disease called as cholestatoma it's not a cancer it's a non malignant disease but again here you see there is a defect in the eardrum and also the bone is involved so this kind of issues also unless and until you visit a ent surgeon he would examine and confirm ki what is the exact nature of your hearing problem now uh, assessment of hearing is very simple we do certain objective or subjective tests and uh, we we determine the nature the quality the quantity of hearing loss so the commonest test which we use is called as a pure tone audiometry uh, which i'll talk about in a while uh second is a tympanometry which gives us a status about the middle ear what exactly happening whether the hearing bones are fixed whether uh, the middle ear pressure is normal the eustachian tube the, the tube which connects the nose and the ear is functioning normal and in kids who can't participate in the hearing test then we use a, a subjective test which is ob objective test where uh, the graphs and the values are determined by attaching a probe like this inside the ear and this is what we call as the ecg of the ear or the auditory brain stem response which is one of the most accurate hearing assessment results a little elaborate than the pure tone audiometry but in certain certain situations we require this auditory brain stem response uh, testing also so a typical hearing test or an audiometry is about a 5 minute test which is done by an audiologist with an audiometer Uh, ideal setting will be a soundproof room with a two door setting with a transparent glass in between the, where the patient is wearing a ear headphone sound stimulus is given by the audiologist through this audiometer she has a speaker to communicate so the responses are given by the patient and proportionately a graph is plotted i showed an audiogram initially how a typical audiogram x axis and y axis and depending upon what the interpretation is we 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 come to know about the hearing issue so most commonest problem what we found find in senior citizens is senile deafness and uh, according to who 80% of all deafnesses is avoidable out of which 50% are preventable and 30% are treatable now evolution of hearing aids i would i would say it's like you know how uh, uh music has uh, music devices have you know kind of transformed over centuries like initially there were gramophones then we had transistor loudspeakers transistors tape recorders cds blu-rays blu-ray cds uh, similarly the hearing aids which were initially one were body level the one the ones which were like transistor with a wire hanging out and things like that now we have this most sophisticated and refined hearing aids which are almost invisible or this smaller bluetooth like devices which women can hide under their hair and things like that and they have variety of features they are uh, there is bluetooth connectivity they are uh, they can be connected to the mobile to the tv and uh, they have uh, features such as you know they can sense the surrounding ambient sound and the internal settings get changed so that the unwanted uh, sounds don't enter and only the conversational or the the the, the voices which are required required for hearing are transmitted inside the ear so the common question asked is which one is better so which hearing aid so it's like you know asking any electronic gadget uh something like a smart tv which one is better there are different brands in the market and all serve the same purpose so as long as you are satisfied with one of the brands and you know you've done a research about it or uh, it, it it it's comfortable on your pocket you should go for that but if you ask me one size doesn't fit all and when we decide about a hearing aid uh, there are certain criteria which we have to keep in mind 
the most important is the degree of hearing loss. So a lot of times patient will come and say, Ki, doctor, uh, uh, can you give a cheaper hearing aid? So it's not about the cost. It's about how much amplification is required to correct your hearing handicap. So the that proportionately uh, you will be recommended a certain model and a mail. Then communication needs. A housewife and a CEO of a company, the needs are different. So obviously, you know, you don't have to go for a very high hand hearing aid if you are homebound and things like that. Age does matter. So higher the deterioration, higher will be the hearing loss. And accordingly, uh, you might require a strong class hearing aid. Then individual choices. As I said, okay, somebody might prefer an iPhone. Somebody might be happy with an Android base also. So similarly, once you are given a multiple option, you are the best judge to select your hearing aid. Now, what we see in practice is there is a lot of inertia, a lot of inertia and reluctance to wear hearing aids. And uh, the biggest uh, reluctance is, you know, the social stigma, especially in women who even after 60 plus think, you know, no, the person surrounding them or the family members may think, you know, she is deaf. But uh, this taboo I have seen only in, in Indian scenario. When I went to Germany and I was doing a fellowship, I used to see people wearing big, big cochlear implants, the speech processor or outside, and nobody used to battle an eyelid. I think it's, it's more to do with our culture and things like that. I think a mindset uh, change is required here key, where we don't look upon patients uh, with hearing aids or cochlear implant devices. Uh, so in, in, in Western countries, you know, they don't give a second look even if you're wearing a hearing device or things like that. So the taboo uh, is definitely there associated with hearing aid. Resistance like being in a state of denial, I can hear. Uh, see, what we are saying here is you are not tone deaf. Your sounds are reaching the ear, but the discrimination problem is there. So definitely that is not we call as, you know, good hearing or something. So you will require a aid to overcome your hearing handicap. And there are misconceptions about hearing aid. Like, mere nana ke chacha ne hearing aid use kiya tha aur wo sound hear nahi kar paate bahut loud sounds jaati hai yes this was the initial problem with hearing aids when people were using analog hearing aids analog hearing aids used to amplify all the sounds so if i am sitting in a quiet room so i would not get the ambient sounds also inside the ear but with a you, uh, with analog hearing aid, if you go in a noisy environment, you go in, on a road or you are in a crowded room, so all the sounds get amplified and obviously you are not able to hear what you are supposed to hear and patients would stop using hearing aids. So this problem has been overcome by digital hearing aids, programmable hearing aids, where uh, selectively we can program the hearing aids according to your hearing uh, requirements so that the unwanted sounds are filtered and the pleasure of hearing is restored. Uh, the most important uh, factor which I feel is they are costly, they are not indigenous. These come from Europe or US and uh, there is a certain price attached to it and they are not covered in insurance. So a lot of uh, senior citizens who are probably dependent upon their their kids or on, on their pension, they are not able to afford this kind of hearing aids. But there are certain issues. If you have a hearing loss which requires a hearing aid and you are not wearing, then you can land up with certain problem. A, so that the hearing aids keep the nerve firing. So if you're not wearing the hearing aids, the hearing deterioration will continue to happen. So if you do serial audiograms and see, and if you're not wearing a hearing aid, it definitely shows a five, 10 decibel hearing loss over a period of years. So which is not a good thing. Second, uh, obviously it gives you hearing and gets back to the social stream. Otherwise patients who are not hearing, they kind of cut off themselves from a crowd or from social gatherings, thinking that they might be ridiculed or you know they might be the laughing stock. 
So a sense of negativity and these patients tends to get a little depressed. So that can be avoided when you start wearing a, accepting and wearing a hearing aids. Uh, it is now, we have enough scientific medical evidence that patients who don't wear hearing aids, they are higher function, cognition, thinking, memory, all those are affected. They are more susceptible for certain problems because the nerve is not firing. That part of the brain where the sound is supposed to go, it becomes a little inactive. inactive. And if this inactivity spreads to the other parts of the brain, then you are at a risk for Alzheimer's and dementia. So the risk of dementia is five times if you're not wearing your hearing aid. So I would conclude this part about senile deafness by saying that blindness separates us from things, but deafness separates us from people. And this was this quote is from none other than Helen Keller, who was not only deaf, but she was also blind. And once she was asked if you were if God was kind enough to give you one sense of uh, one sense back, then what would you have? And she said, Ki, I would like to have my hearing back. Now, tinnitus is another symptom which, which affects uh, senior citizens. And uh, this can be either a whistling or a ringing, humming, buzzing kind of noise, differently described by different type of patient. Now, the most important thing to understand here is, again, it's a symptom, it's not a disease. So underlying pathology or cause needs to be investigated. One of the most important cause of tinnitus is senile deafness. So again, resistance to wearing a hearing aid, your deterioration of hearing nerve will continue. And so much so to a level where you will start getting tinnitus. And this is a very disabling symptom because we don't have any permanent treatment or it's not, it's reversible. And this will definitely affect you so much so that your sleep can get disturbed. We've had patients uh, in medical literature who have also committed suicide because of uh, disabling tinnitus. So this should not, you should not reach a stage where you are resisting your hearing aid and you know reach a level where tinnitus starts developing because as I said, we don't have any, uh, many, uh, definitive uh, medical management for this condition or a surgical treatment for this condition. The third most common problem related to ears is vertigo. So as we know, our ears, they not only help us hear, but they also help us to maintain balance. The inner ear has the balance sense organ. So balance is basically dependent upon our, upon our brain, our eyes, our inner ear balance system and our joint and muscle sensations, which continuously are going from the left and right side towards the brain. When there is harmony, when there is symmetry, we don't experience any dizziness, any swaying, any wobbly sensation, and we maintain our, our posture. But if you start getting a spinning sensation of your own self or your surrounding, which is an illusion, this happens because of the balance system or vestibular system. And this is a very common problem which we see in elderly population. And this is again, mostly because of aging of the vestibular system, but there might be other causes which can be also causing this vertigo. Again, vertigo is a symptom, it's not a disease. I, I know a lot of patients who come to me with, you know, right saying we have been diagnosed vertigo by our family physician. So I am like, okay, uh, and the vertigo is because of and they don't have an answer. And I've had patients who have been taking vertigo medications for three months, six months. The oldest, I have had a patient who has taken the same drug for two years and so much so that anxiety psychosis has developed and he's not ready to let go of the medicine that he says, he no, if I don't take the medicine, I feel I'll be very dizzy, uncomfortable and things like that. So an uh, ENT specialist is the one who you should be going first because it's a gray area. So sometimes you don't know whether to go to a neurologist, or orthopedic surgeon, or a physician who would be treating a vertigo. But out of 10 times, seven to eight times, your vertigo is related to your 
ears, your inner ear, your vestibular system. And an ENT person should be the first person you should go and consult. Now, there are certain issues which are related to nose. And the commonest which we see is nosebleeds or epistaxis. Now, a lot of senior citizens are hypertension patients, blood pressure patients. They are uh, cardiac patients. They, they are on antiplatelet drugs or what we call as blood thinners, ecosprain or clopilet or warfarin and things like that. So if you have a sudden rise in blood pressure, you will start having spontaneous bleeding from the nose. The minute you see the sight of blood, your blood pressure shoots up and it's like a vicious cycle. More the blood pressure, more the bleeding, more the panic, again the blood pressure going up. So I would advise whenever there is no bleeding, first of all, stay calm. Uh, try to pinch your nostril and give pressure on the bleeding uh, portion. Uh, you might have to tilt a little forward with your mouth open so that the blood doesn't go into the throat and you are able to spit it out. Uh, ice can be applied. If you have a blood pressure uh, measuring device at home, check your blood pressure. If the blood pressure has shot up excessively, then it needs to be uh, got under control immediately. So home remedies would be pinching and pressurizing the bleeding point, applying ice. If still the bleeding is not stopping and there is excessive bleeding, then I would uh, advise to push in a nice clean cloth in the bleeding nostril till the time you reach or close by a nursing home or an hospital where you can see immediate intervention. So the blood thinners don't help to clot the blood and then the bleeding is more and more panic sets in. So my advice would be to stay calm, keep your pressure under control, don't miss your tablets. And uh, winter and summer is the time when the nasal mucosa or nasal lining dries up and is crusting. Don't disturb the crust. Uh, use moisturizing lotion of their own and you don't create raw areas which will, which will trigger this bleeding. Another problem related to nose indirectly is what we call as epiphora or eyes. Now I'm saying is nose because the lacrimal system stands with the lacrimal gland which produces tears which go along the surface of the cornea keeping the cornea moistened and then enters this tiny opening called as the punctum and these channels which are called canaliculi at the upper and the lower portion of the upper and the lower eyelid and then it goes to a sac or the tear sac and gets drained inside the nose. So this is how the indirect connection is there related to nose. So this happens usually because there is blockage. It's a basically a choking and a plumbing issue. So there is a drainage issue of the tears. These tears are going into the nose and into the throat. And it's a very insensible thing. But if there is blockage, then it gives uh, excessive watering of the eyes and causes blurring of your vision. And most of the patients who require cataract surgery, the surgeon, the eye surgeon is not ready to operate the eye unless this issue is sorted. So, so this issue can be sorted by an eye surgeon or an ENT. Eye surgeon will do externally giving a scar on the face, but an endoscopic ENT surgeon will go through inside the nostril and open up this drainage point so that even if any of this passage is blocked, the tear drainage is restored. And finally, coming to throat-related issue, the common issue which we see uh, in senior citizen is what we call as acid reflux, laryngopharyngeal reflux, LPR, or also called as throat acidity. So here we see a, a endoscopic picture of the throat. This is the base of the tongue. These are the vocal cords. This is the trachea or the windpipe. And this is the region where the food enters into our stomach. And what we here typically see is reddishness of this portion in front of the food pipe opening. And this is classical of what we call as laryngopharyngeal reflux. Now our, our stomach lining and our food pipe lining can bear the brunt of acid, digestive acid and enzymes and juices. Uh, but 
due to some reason, if this acid or the digestive juices come into the throat, it is not uh, not uh, able to handle this uh, chemical pH. And in that response, it produces mucus. And patients of uh, typical of uh, acid reflux will say, if they have a sensation, something is stuck in the throat and they have to keep on constantly clearing the cough and they feel as if, you know, uh, the throat is always choked up. So uh, this is a very common issue and all you need to do is a small endoscopy by an ENT surgeon. This is an endoscopy, a real-time endoscopy. I will just play this video. Here we see a patient who's sitting in front of me. I'm holding his tongue and the endoscopic is going parallel to the tongue. And you can see the vocal cords and then this reddish areas and this typical granular or irregular areas, which is characteristic of the acid coming up in the throat. So this scopy doesn't take up even a minute, but it confirms the diagnosis. It also rules out other problems, tumors or any vocal cord paralysis or any neurological issues which might be causing this issue. So this is a very common problem, acid reflux or laryngopharyngeal reflux in front. And needless to say, snoring. Uh, this is ghar ghar ki kahani. You know, typical, the spouses think ki if there was a silencer, they could fit on their uh, spouse's nose or throat. So some go to an extreme lens also. And there has been, uh, in Western world, there have been divorces because of snoring of the partner. So what happens in snoring is the airway, the passage, when we start breathing from the nose, it's supposed to remain open even during sleep. But during sleep, this passage, which is more like a muscular tube, it loses its tone and it collapses. And in addition to that, if you have any obstruction in this breathing passage right from the level of the nose, to the throat. So whether you have a deviated nasal septum, that is the partition which develops the, which separates the nostril is crooked or blocking one of the nostrils. You have hypertopic turbinates. These are sausage-like portions inside the nose because of allergy, they are swollen up. Or adenoids, which are very common in children, even children snore. So which is obstructing your breathing, then you have this obstructive sleep apnea where your breathing stops for a few seconds. Even in a normal seven, eight hours sl uh, sleep, uh, we have this few millisecond, brief millisecond uh, uh, pauses where breathing completely stops. But if you don't have a pathological apnea, then the breathing is restored. But if you have a pathological problem, like an obstruction, or if the brain is not able to send signals to keep this passage open, what we call as central, central apnea, then you will land up with certain problems. And the commonest problems what we see about obstructive sleep apnea is daytime drowsiness. Like the body is supposed to inhale carbon dioxide and expel CO2, but because of this blockage, the CO2 is not expelled out. It remains stagnated in the body. And CO2 has a property to put you to sleep, cause induced narcosis. So these patients will fall at the drop of the head. Hat. You know, you, sometimes you're just talking to this person and you suddenly notice that he has fallen asleep. And more dangerous it is when they are on the wheel, when they are driving and they meet with near fatal accidents. Uh, this pushes to certain cardiac problems like hypertension, certain heart attacks. Most of us, we hear from, you know, he passed away peacefully in sleep. Probably, you know, if you if you would have been investigated, probably uh, he might be suffering from a obstructive sleep apnea. Those pauses, those brief pauses, probably in its case got extended for a for a longer period, and the brain couldn't uh, couldn't awaken that person, and he just you know stopped breathing and he had an heart attack. It makes you more susceptible to certain uh, neurological problems like stroke, memory loss, causes metabolic problems like diabetes. Uh, it can push you to depression, uh, insomnia. And as I said, the death is a, a real uh, risk with snoring and sleep apnea patient. Again, we do an endoscopy. This is a real-time endoscopy. This is looking inside the nostril. We see a very hypertrophic passage, a crowded nose, hardly any passage to breathe. Just looking with an endoscope, a flexible endoscope. 
now as i advance the scope with very difficulty i can manage to get into this tiny space and this is the junction of the nose ending and meeting the throat so it's a very crowded passage and this patient will have really bad snoring so unless investigated this might go unnoticed and this definitely requires surgical correction and this is looking at the back of the nose what we call as nasopharynx sometimes there are hypertrophied adenoids here and we see the vocal cords here and the breathing passage so we induce the patient to sleep by giving him a sleep medication and real time we observe his airway what level is the airway and then decide a, a plan and a management for this now this can be treated non surgically by using devices such as bipap and cpap where nothing but you have to wear this mask which is connected with a tube which is connected to this this machine so a sleep study will tell ki how much pressure is required for inspiration and expiration every day every night you have to wear this mask and this prevents your snoring and other uh, risks which are associated with snoring so uh, not all patients are tolerant to they they find claustrophobic or they have uh, anatomical problems so the pressures are very high the noise of the machine itself doesn't let them sleep so if those patients may require surgeries then so in surgeries we do variety of surgeries depending upon what level the obstruction we have to unclog so sometimes we have to remove a part of the palate tongue what we call as a classical u triple p or a uvulo pharyngoplasty where by removing surgically we have managed to widen the airway or the the diameter of the breathing passage and this is how post surgery the tongue looks the oral cavity looks where there is no small tongue or the uvula and the palate is appearing scarred but what we can see is definitely the space is improved sometimes the palate might have to be addressed where we use a radio frequency to do, do this channeling sometimes we have to make cuts and suture to shrink the palate so if a palate is looking like this before where you can't see the uvula or the breathing the throat and after surgery here you can see a glimpse of the throat so depending upon the diagnosis and the level of obstruction the treatment is planned so i would end my presentation and would uh, be happy to uh, take the questions thank you dr thank you. Uh, very detailed presentation and uh, session but we have a problem you know i have 30 questions that have come in or somewhere around that and uh, there are a few which have come by the mail also so i'm going to get into the questions uh, soonest so we have a question from uh, uh, mr k v lakshmi narayan who uh, asks uh, i have a small growth in my voice pack in my voice box uh, polyp i think with medication it has not subsided is there a way to avoid surgery so is a benign non cancerous growth on the vocal cord usually it's on single vocal cord but sometimes it can be bilateral also the commonest symptom that you will have is hoarseness or huskiness or change of voice sometimes it can cause breathlessness also so there is no medical management for uh, polyps and it's better that it needs to be operated surgically and the excise specimen needs to be test tested for cancer also so i would definitely say ki there is no medical management and ideally you should get operated rather than avoid the surgery thank you we have a question from mr navin chandra shetty who is male 72 years he asks is there a safe method to remove ear wax okay so this is a, again a very common issue and uh, i have posted a video on youtube uh, you can go through which addresses the issue because i probably have to answer this question about 10 times a day 
So I have made a video and you know, for the information of the general public, I've put it. So let's understand wax first. Wax is, wax is a natural secretion like sweat. It is secreted in the ear by the wax glands for a purpose. It prevents dryness of the ear canal skin. It is antibacterial. It, it helps to uh, trap dust, uh, especially when you are in a dusty environment. And it is produced on a daily basis and it's got a natural auto cleansing mode also. So whatever is, is prepared, which is produced, after it's used, it gets excreted also without it's a without our knowledge by propelled by our jaw movements. So only people who tend to fidget with this natural process by using earbuds or shoving any foreign objects, they they disrupt this process, they push the wax further inside toward the narrowest portion of the ear, causing more ear wax secretion and more wax deposition. Eventually, they will have blockage, pain, hearing issues, and sometimes uh, so much so that they might require attention. So I would say ki there is, the answer to your question is, ki A, you don't need to clean your ears regularly. You don't need to put anything inside your ears. What you should do is annually, you should get your ears examined. If there is wax, then in a scientific way with special equipment and instruments, a ENT specialist will be able to clean it for you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Mr. K. A. Suryana, who is age 69. I'm getting cough once I get up in the morning and continue for about 20 minutes. Spit cough, off white color. Uh, it stops after 20 minutes. Some days continuous and some days intermittently. He needs right. as well. So uh, we would know, need more history on that. But uh, what I would most important would like to know whether he's a smoker or not. Because the, the cough he's describing can be a typical smoker's cough also. So acid reflux won't give you so much cough. And uh, uh, there are other issues which we need to look in also. This can be a simple bronchitis also, which can be causing this kind of cough. So unless we do, we have more history and uh, examine this patient, we'll not be able to give any definitive advice to this patient. Right, thank you. We have a question from Mr. Tandakar Velhal, who says, my left ear is very weak to listen since many years. Can you suggest any drops? There are a couple of more questions. Uh, on, uh, yeah, so his other question was good ear drops for, for anti-allergic. Uh, so the first part I didn't get. He said his ear is weak. His left ear is very weak since many years. Weak means he means uh, he's unable to hear. Una unable to listen. Weak to listen. Yeah. Right. And how old is he? He is. Uh, 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 he hasn't mentioned his age. Right. So uh, I'm assuming since we are addressing to this senior uh, population, so. This might be a age-related hearing issue, what we call a senile deafness. And uh, yes, an accurate assessment will be done by an audiometry testing. And depending upon the hearing loss, if it's mild, probably it might be put in on some supplements. But if there is moderate to severe hearing loss, then as I've already mentioned in my talk, it's better and appropriate that a suitable hearing aid is worn so that not only the deterioration is arrested, but also other issues such as Alzheimer's and, you know, dementia are also kept at bay. Right. Um, thank you. We have a question from Mr. DJ Santa Maria. Uh, could acid refluxes be the beginning of cancer? Yes. In the long run, if it's not, uh, if it's been a very chronic process and it's not treated, yet it can definitely be a risk factor for cancer of the throat also. Right. We have a question from Mr. Shankar Chauhan, who is uh, 82 years old. He says he has, he has a problem of distance hearing and differentiating between two or more consonants. Yes. So what happens is once your speech frequencies are affected, speech frequencies are the ones 
where on an audiogram we have an area which we call a speech banana where your consonants and your vowels are fa falling and if typically the graph shows ki your deterioration is beyond the speech banana then of course then there is no way uh, medicines or surgery can help you then probably you will require a hearing aid if you are if you don't have any pre existing ear disease or anything right thank you we have a question from asha nigam uh, who asks what are cyst like structures on one tonsil yeah so sometimes you see this yellowish or uh, brownish soft bulges on your tonsils these are fluid filled swellings which are again benign non cancerous uh, most of the time asymptomatic but just because you have noticed them then you start observing them more and then uh, sometimes anxiety sets in the whether any cancer is kind of you know uh, coming up there so most of the cysts don't require any intervention but if they are symptomatic or they are growing in size affecting your speech or causing you discomfort pain or more so if the anxiety levels are high then the only way would be to eradicate them is a tonsillectomy surgery but as i said most of them are harmless benign if you just do an annual check up and you know uh, keep a tab on them you won't require any active intervention for them right thank you we have you know very many questions that have come in i'm just taking some representative questions uh, and then we'll take on the the, the others uh, we have a couple of questions on earphones one is by rajesh varma who says can i use earphones if i have moderately severe hearing loss he is 70 uh, there's another question from someone who's an anonymous attendee who asks is it okay to use earphones like the ones we use for uh, for mobile phones or is it harmful especially the bluetooth variety and there's a third question which is also there uh, from navin chandra shetty who asks which is better wired headphone or wireless right so all these are probably uh, you know related to wearing hearing devices uh, the headsets or the ear pods whether a uh, wired one is better or wireless and better so uh, the concern here is ki whether using excessively the mobile phone or uh, being on the phone continuously affect your hearing or no so what we advocate is a simple 60 60 rule when you have to attend say long meetings or when children have to attend uh, online classes so if you have to hear with a hearing device in your ear so a better one would be the one which stays on the ear rather than goes inside the ear because the sound pressure level is low when it rests outside the ear rather than it goes inside the ear and then we follow a rule called as 60 60 60 3 times 60 so 60 minutes continuously you can use your ear devices whether those are headsets earbuds uh the ones which wire is better than the the bluetooth one they tend to cause less uh, sensory neural or high frequency hearing loss you can use continuously for 60 seconds but uh, 60 minutes but after 60 seconds you take a break of 60 seconds minimum not only it helps to recover the ear but sometimes if you are using the device the ear ear earbuds which are going inside the ear they tend to cause irritation of the ear canal skin and causing ear infection so you get a breather from that also the last part of the 60 60 is you don't keep the device volume for more than 60% of its range so whether you use it be it a laptop or a mobile so you follow the 60 60 rule and i don't think then you should have this uh hearing issue related to uses using excessively any device sorry what was the last thing which you said you don't keep it the uh, the volume to 60% than... of the range of the device volume so you don't keep it excessively high like teenagers they like to hear music with high volumes so right. which is very detrimental for hearing so even even the the mobiles give you a warning you know you have a flash on your screen the volume is too high so 
the device volume should not be more than 60% of its full range. Right. Thank you. This is very valuable information as well. Uh, this is a question which you answered uh, in a sense with uh, on tinnitus. Uh, this is by uh, Mr. Chandrakan Vehar again, who is age 66, 76. He says, why does the tinkling noise comes in both the years? This is persisting for many years. Yeah, so uh, there are other causes of uh, tinnitus also apart from age-related hearing loss or press biases. So one needs to investigate that. So uh, if he is having any other associated symptoms, like a, a menial disease patient who has a vertigo issue will not only have hearing loss, but he will have a tinnitus also. Similarly, if a patient is uh, uh, taking autotoxic drugs, so then he might be having this tinnitus, which is there. So the first and the foremost investigation one should undergo after an ENT examination is an audiometry test. If the graph confirms there is degeneration of the nerve by the typical pattern of the audiometry report, then depending upon the hearing loss and depending upon the cause of the, the tinnitus, uh, appropriate uh, treatment will be advised. But most of the times, the tinnitus, uh, like senile deafness, is irreversible, permanent, and it can be really disabling. Thank you. Doctor. We're nearing six o'clock, so I'm going to ask just two more questions, and then I'm uh, going to request you to still look at some of the questions that we've sent, we've received, and if you can respond to them later, and I think we must we need to have another session with you uh, soon. Uh, there's a question from uh, Mr. Gurdeep Straw. He's uh, yet again one of our regular uh, uh, readers. Why is there dryness in the throat? He is uh, male 65. Yeah, so there are multiple reasons, common reasons for dryness of the throat. The first and the foremost is he, if your breathing is not happening the, the, the normal way, if you don't have nasal breathing, where the nose is supposed to filter and humidify air and then it is supposed to reach your lungs. So this we see commonly when patients undergo nose surgery, they are breathing through your mouth and they develop dryness of the throat. So one should find out if there is any blockage in the nose, which is obstructing uh, the typical normal physiological nasal breathing. Second would be dryness of the mouth related to decreased salivary production. So with aging, the salivary production also tends to diminish and then that can be. Certain diseases, certain medications also can cause uh, dryness of the throat. So these are the, some of the common uh, situations where there can be dryness of the throat. And if your water intake itself is inadequate, dryness of the throat might be the first pointer that enough hydration is not happening. Thank you. Doctor, uh, you had mentioned that one needs to do annual checkups uh, for uh, uh, the audiometric tests. Now, there's a question from uh, Mr. Navid Chandra Shetty. He says, are the usual audiometry tests that are conducted in the senior citizen medical test packages, which are offered with uh, by diagnostic labs and many hospitals, are they good indicators? So the only thing needs to be seen is if, if the ambient sounds are not high during testing, then the, the, those health packages of audiometry tests should suffice. But uh, I have seen that not most of the diagnostic centers are well equipped with a proper sound treated or a, what we call as a soundproof room. So you might get erroneous results. And also, since it's a subjective test where the participation of the patient is equally important, if the responses are not accurate, then, then there might be an error in the report. Right. Uh, doctor, we'll take one more question uh, from Minal Bajaj, who says uh, she has heavy, uh, she has eye pressure and pain all around her cheek, eyebrow temples, so can't watch TV or video call. Kindly say why. So, a couple of things come to my mind immediately after hearing such typical history. A is sinusitis and second is 
migraine. So if she has typical history of colds and the pain is associated during the active episode of cold, then probably it will fall in the category of sinusitis. But no, if she has more of headache or, you know, when she's stressed or anxious and this pain comes up, then it will fall more in the migraine variety. Uh, doctor, we still have several questions that are there, perhaps around 20 questions that have not been answered. Uh, but uh, Sorry, I overshot the time in my presentation. Okay. I, I, I know. I'm going to ask you to come once again to our uh, uh, for our health session because you've seen the kind of questions that have come in and these are all genuine and, you know, uh, almost all of them are senior citizens. So, uh, and these, these questions... Uh, so, maybe we can do a part two where the presentation is already there. So, we can just take the questions directly in the next session. That's right. That's right. We will... Uh, I'll take you up on that. But uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Doifare, for your time. Excellent presentation and uh, uh, excellent session that we had. Uh, you know, I, I must tell you that this was a special demand that we had from our... Uh, uh, regulars here and some people who came in last time, they said that, you know, we want a session on, on ENT. So we have addressed that. Um, I must thank uh, uh, the folks at Nanavati Hospital who have helped facilitate uh, this session. So thank you very much again, Dr. Daifare, for this session um, uh, and for speaking to our readers and uh, our attendees here. We will be back once again uh, next Saturday with another session of Health Live at uh, uh, Seniors Today. We are going to have Dr. Prasanna Shah uh, who will be addressing us uh, next week and he is going to be speaking ab about uh, endoscopy and uh, 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 colonoscopy. Uh, this is next Saturday, that is September 4th at 5 p.m. So please be there and uh, uh, once again, Dr. Daifare, thank you for your time. Uh, you know, it is one and a half hours valuable time of yours on a Saturday evening. And um, to all of you here, thank you very much. And we'll meet once again next week. Thank you. Thank you, Pradeep for having me over. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks.